Okay, I'll go ahead and, and get us started since I think we've got everybody um, added into the room as quickly as we can. We've waited several minutes after 11. Hamakas um, Katsiao, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, in in-person spaces and in traditional um, Native American community spaces, we open a particular way. Um, we have a culturally appropriate way that we try to ground folks into the space. So I invite you to take a, a few deep breaths with us. Um, relax into your chair or wherever you might be. Um, allow yourself to settle in and be comfortable in the space this morning. And we will go ahead and get started with an honor song, which um, is going to be sang by the Rose Creek Singers. The Rose Creek Singers are an all women's drum group from the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And we are so excited to have them here with us. And I invite them to get started when they're ready. Deep gratitude for that song. We'll take just a moment to readjust our cameras. Um, Amy, I invite you to unmute yourself. Um, while we're repinning some cameras, uh, the purpose of our honor songs in some of our indigenous communities is to really pay homage to our ancestors, to really recognize um, the work that we're doing now for our descendants. Um, in addition to that, we um, want to make sure that we're honoring the lost lives in the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous people. We want to also honor the folks who have been doing this work before us in this moment today, um, which is also very important. So again, Rose Creek, thank you so much for joining us and offering that honor song today. If we can spotlight Jeannie, I invite Jeannie, an elder of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, um, to offer our invocation for today's session. I'm burning the sage right now that it might offer up our prayers and our love for our missing 
and murdered indigenous sisters. And I offer this prayer for each and every one of those of our sisters, our daughters, our mothers, our grandmothers, for those that are kept in captivity, for those that have given their lives, that have now become elders and have crossed over, that they have crossed over to visit with their relatives, with the ancestors, and that now their soul, their heart is at peace. So we ask for blessings upon our sisters that remain in captivity. We ask that you give them strength of heart, of mind, of body, to bless them that they might be able to one day be set free. These are the prayers that we're asking for as we all join here together, one heart, one mind, that our prayers will reach out to the creator, Kulin Sut and the Motkin. And as we light our sage and our sweet grass and our candles, that these prayers will go to the creator that he will answer the prayers and return our lost sisters back to our families. And we offer a special prayer for the families of the lost ones. We offer a special prayer for the families of those that have the missing daughters, sisters, mothers, grandmothers. We pray for the safe return of each and every one. And in doing this prayer, we are grateful for the union of each of those that are here at this conference, that we are all continue to be of one mind, one heart, and one body as we pray for our sisters. And as we're here, I ask my husband to offer a song in prayer for our sisters. Lem Lynch. so much for offering a um, very powerful song for um, our lost relatives, for those who may be sick, for those who, who need these prayers this morning, and for each of us who uh, I hope shows up in a good way. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Jeannie, for joining us. Thank you, Rose Creek. Um, before I, I jump in to any further introductions, I'd also like to um, offer a brief land acknowledgement. Uh, an old Nimipu or Nez Perce warrior spoke that the earth is part of my body. I belong to the land out of which I came and the earth is my mother. Uh, it is a political statement. It is a social statement to um, acknowledge that we are broadcasting from um, the indigenous territory of the Shoshone Bannock, Shoshone Paiute, uh, and Yakima indigenous nations. In addition to um, the Treasure Valley where we are, I'd like to acknowledge that Idaho is built on the Coeur d'Alene, Nez Perce and Kootenai nations ancestral territory as well. Um, we hope that if you um, are joining us that you give some, some intentional thought to whose land that you're occupying now, um, whose territory you are, we in the chat can offer a link um, that could actually show you whose territory you're on in the indigenous language of those people. So I'll have one of my tech folks drop that in the chat for you. Tatsmewi, oikolo, hamakis, katsiaoya, 
Inem Uniktwas Atit Watit, Soyapo Uniktwas Tai Simpson, Inwas Nimipu Ayat, Lotloitsa Kina, Inem Nixasa Hiwis Timina Ilp Ilkanich. I uh, have just now opened the session in my indigenous language as an honor and homage to my ancestors and to my descendants. I told you that my name is the storyteller in the indigenous language of the Nimipu Nation, commonly known as the Nez Perce tribe. I told you um, that my name in English is Ty Simpson. I am an advocate with the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. I told you that I'm a descendant of Chief Red Heart of the Nimipu or Nez Perce Nation of Idaho. And I also told you that I am so very happy to be here. Um, why are we here? This is the um, virtual conference honoring missing and murdered indigenous women, indigenous people. Um, we titled this using the indigenous language of the Bannock people, which is why I won't venture a try at their language. I really um, hope to learn how to speak speak those words in uh, the correct way to honor the nation that provided those words to us. I would like to acknowledge that the title um, was given to us by the Shoshone Bannock elders, language keepers, Lori Edmo and her sister Louise Dixie, I believe are the two primary folks who supported us in naming um, our conference. Um, going back towards home, you know, ultimately, um, because we're seeing violence in indigenous communities and because we are adversely affected by um, the intersections of systemic oppression and racism um, and adverse violence, I would really love um, like for us to to take away, you know, how we can each on a personal level do this work, how we can um, bring this work and bring this new knowledge back home to our communities and going back towards home is exactly that for each of us, while at the same time we continue our tireless efforts to find our missing relatives, to bring justice um, to those who are lost to us, and um, to continue um, our community building efforts with our non-native neighbors. I think that um, we have an opportunity to work in a collaborative way moving forward, especially around equity and justice justice and um, addressing and mitigating violence in Native American communities. Um, again, I'm so thankful that you're all here with us. Um, the goal is um, not only technical skills, practical application, we also are storytellers at the coalition. So we hope to connect some of these deep and renowning stories around um, our missing relatives, around violence in indigenous communities, how we can address it from a policy standpoint. We hope that you take away those skills, not just today as part of Sarah's session, but across the month of the virtual conference. I would like to briefly acknowledge um, that this conference is brought to you and hosted by the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence. Um, we are supported and partnering with the Idaho Council on Domestic Violence and Victims Assistance. Um, we also have some contributions and support from the United States Department of Justice as well. If you um, would like to read more about our organization, please visit us at um, engagingvoices.org. You will see links and some of these names as our partners to this conference. Um, I would like to now offer space to the United States Attorney for Idaho, um, Bart Davis. Um, I believe he was also a Senator in our state for a while prior to um, his position with the Department of Justice. Uh, we've invited Bart to offer these opening remarks for a couple of reasons. The inception of this conference started as part of the Idaho Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Summit that took place back in December of 2019. It was um, a new and spearheading effort around addressing violence and the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women by um, policymakers in Idaho, by um, tribal leadership, by advocates running victim service programs on the reservations in Idaho. So it was a true community effort and bringing so many voices from advocacy, tribal leadership and policymakers really does change the way that we do this work. And so we're carrying it forward by way of this conference, but also um, would love to recognize that the United States Attorney for Idaho um, was part of the inception and part of this learning. So Bart, I pass it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ty. Uh, can you see me? I don't, I mean, I'm not looking to see me, but I don't know if the video is working, is it? 
we we see a screen but not actually your face all right let's see so if i go here and i go here because do you have something covering your camera by chance no no just my face <laughs> Uh, how's there that? There we go. Uh, that's Thank a little better. I had it, it was showing you the wallpaper behind me instead <laughs> of, of showing me. Uh, okay. In March, uh, uh, the Idaho legislature passed House Concurrent Resolution 33. It's an important expression recognizing May 5th is a day of awareness for missing and, and uh, murdered indigenous people or MMIP. More importantly, the resolution calls on the governor, Department of Justice, FBI, Idaho State Police, Idaho's five federally recognized tribes, local law enforcement, the Idaho Council on Domestic Violence, the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence to make recommendations regarding missing or murdered indigenous people for increased victim services, better coordination of information between governmental and non-governmental organizations, improved coordination among law enforcement, additional data needs and public outreach. Now I'm a storyteller too, but I wanna to read to you the last paragraph. Quote, be it further resolved, that the legislature does hereby honor the lives of all missing and murdered indigenous people and reaffirms its commitment to protecting the safety and well being of all Idahoans, especially those most vulnerable. Now, I understand that Tyrell Stevenson, on behalf of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, together with the review and input from each of Idaho's tribes wrote this uh, concurrent resolution. If you haven't read it, you should. When this concurrent resolution came before the State Affairs Committee for hearing, I decided to attend. I intended to just slip over to the Capitol and sit in the back and of the committee room and watch the hearing unfold. You, you see in my present position, I'm not supposed to be involved in legislative advocacy. I even told the chairwoman before that I was only going to attend and watch, not participate. Well, the hearing began and the resolution was ably presented. Then the chairwoman, Senator Patty Ann Lodge, called me forward to speak. I was surprised but decided to share a few words. I didn't have prepared remarks, so I spoke from my heart. I recall saying then, and I re-emphasize now, that indigenous women face alarming levels of violence, murder rates that are greater than 10 times the national average, homicide, that's the third leading cause of death between ages 10 and 24, and the fifth leading cause of death for those ages 25 to 34. And that viol the violence rate among native men is 30% more likely than non-Hispanic white men. I asked the State Affairs Committee to pass a resolution to be aware of and sensitive to the reality of murdered or missing indigenous people to increase awareness and participate in making others aware of this crisis that exists among some of our most noble of fellow citizens, to work with and listen, truly listen to tribal leaders and members, to respect the tribal council's federally recognized legal rights, to encourage state and local law enforcement to be part of the solution, to work with their tribal law enforcement partners. I told my former colleagues that I have a statutory trust duty to Indian country, but that all have a sacred trust responsibility to ensure that all Idahoans, including our tribal sisters and brothers are respected, supported and protected. 
Now a quick pause. Is it missing and murdered or missing or murdered? Legislatively, I learned that and can mean or, and or can mean and. In this instance, I mean and means and or, and or. Now, you may remember that it was about this time last year when U.S. Attorney General Barr launched the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Initiative, a national strategy to enhance public safety partnerships, also known as Operation Lady Justice. Well, then on Monday, September 21st, 2020, just a little more than two weeks ago, unexpectedly to many of us, Congress passed Savannah's Act as well as the Not Invisible Act, which impose statutory duties. Initially, it appears these efforts and Operation Lady Justice are similar in purpose, but slightly different in operation. Now, I looked this morning to see if the president had signed it. Uh, it's my understanding he intends to sign it, and based on the date of transmission, he has until either October 12th or 13th. But as of this morning, I couldn't find that he had signed those two bills. Well, Operation Lady Justice pushed a three-part strategy. Strategy one is coordinators. Initially, the department was to hire 11 MMIP coordinators in 11 states to serve all the United States attorneys in those states and other districts who request assistance. Although Idaho was not initially selected, our neighboring states of Montana and Oregon, excuse me, uh, Montana and Oregon were. These coordinators were to work closely with federal, tribal, state, and local agencies to develop common protocols and procedures for responding to MMIP reports. Idaho's own Ernie Wayan from Boise is Montana's coordinator. Strategy two dealt with response protocols. Uh, upon request of tribal, state, or local law enforcement, the FBI is to provide expert assistance and resources in MMIP cases. And the coordinators were to insist, assist in developing these response uh, protocols. The third strategy dealt with data and analysis. The department was to perform in-depth analysis of federally supported databases and analyze data collection practices to identify ways to improve missing person data and share the results with our partners. Data has been an issue. It shouldn't be the barrier to addressing the problem. Still, we must know what the data is and how the data is reported, collected, and updated. A, a little more on that in a moment. Well, progress was and is being made on these three strategies. However, the pandemic, in my opinion, quieted some of the listening sessions and important input. Now it appears to me at least, Operation Lady Justice may need to be folded in to the purposes of Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act. These acts require similar action and in addition, reports to Congress within 180 days. For instance, Savannah's Act requires the Justice Department to report MM MMIP statistics, develop guidelines for response, conduct outreach, provide law enforcement training uh, on how agencies are to record tribal enrollment for victims in federal databases. Well, one of my important takeaways from last December's uh, conference that uh, uh, was, uh, was what, something that uh, Ty uh, had talked about um, uh, when she encouraged uh, or helped me to understand that, a, that cultural 
explanations that tribal data is often storied data or cultural data and often animus based historic relationships has been and is a barrier to providing data to non indigenous people. If so, I worry if the data will be fully reliable or how Savannah's act or strategy number three will take storied or cultural data into account. And I'm really hoping that people can help me better understand how that will happen. The, the Not Invisible Act is intended to complement Savannah's Act by requiring the Interior Department to coordinate efforts to reduce violence against Native Americans by requiring Interior to appoint an officer to to quote, coordinate prevention efforts, grants and programs related to missing Indians and the murder and human trafficking of Indians, close quotes. Both my office and I strongly support the policy purposes of Operation Lady Justice, Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act. We are committing resources to better understand our responsibilities and to be part of developing those guidelines. Nationally and in Idaho, the large majority of investigations and prosecutions on tribal lands are violent crimes. The most investigated, child sexual abuse, violent assaults and adult sexual assaults, followed by homicide and other forms of child abuse, drug, and property crimes. While my office, working with law enforcement at all levels, is responsible for the investigation and prosecution of these cases, we all agree it would be better if these cases hadn't occurred at all. That's why the multidisciplinary approach is critically important on tribal lands. Incarceration alone does not cure the issues underlying violence. To vulnerable or perceived lesser valued voices, it doesn't matter why we help, it only matters that we help. When we do, lives are protected and hope is restored. As the US Attorney for the District of Idaho, I lead a group of dedicated federal prosecutors who remain committed to address the important principles and policies of Operation Lady Justice, as well as the policies of Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I look forward to hearing Sarah, uh, Sarah Deer's plenary remarks. Thank you, Ty. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate having you. Um, thank you for your continued support of this work that we're doing in Idaho. Um, we, you know, will continue to do our best to build these partnerships. Um, this is a before before I introduce our plenary. I do want to acknowledge something that we've touched on as we got started this morning. Um, it is absolutely imperative to give all of the credit to grassroots organizers, activists, families, and survivors who drive our work to address violence in Indian country along, especially when they have missing or murdered relatives. Um, without them, without their stories, without their bravery, without their courage, we would not be in a place to do this work and drive this work forward on a legislative or policy level. So to those survivors, to those families, um, thank you, um, a moment of deep gratitude for you. Um, okay, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Uh, I have been elated at the opportunity to be able to uh, invite Sarah Deer to our event. We hosted at the coalition a book club around um, the beginning and end of rape um, that Sarah Deer wrote a few years back. And it was an opportunity for several of us in the community, either um, 
matriarchs or um, advocates, educators, students who are interested in having a better sense of what it means to address violence in Indian country, we use that book as a jumping off point and then continue that work as part of this conference. And fortunately for us, we get to dig a little bit deeper because she's here. Uh, Sarah Deer is our keynote speaker and a citizen of the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma. She's also a professor at the University of Kansas. Um, throughout her life, she is both a lawyer and an advocate. Um, and her scholarship is particularly on the intersection of federal Indian law and victims' rights and using indigenous feminist principles as a framework. If you have not already, the second chapter of The Beginning and End of Rape is called uh, what she say it be law and it's my favorite work about indigenous feminism and how important matriarchy is to community building um, law governance for many tribal communities in the United States so thank you Sarah for that chapter for that book and for your work um, and please um, everybody from your home <laughs> welcome Sarah dear to the stage well, thank you very, very much. Um, it is an honor to be here. I'm very excited about um, your series of events. Um, I, if I weren't so busy, I would try to attend every single session. It's an, an incredibly powerful lineup and I wanna just give a big shout out to everyone who organized this event. I know it's not easy. Um, everything's gone online and there's always going to be, you know, challenges with everybody getting the tech right. And I know that there's been a tremendous amount of work put into this and it's just an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, can I ask if folks can see my PowerPoint? We certainly can, thank you, Sarah. Oh, great, okay. Um, first again, just thank you for this opportunity um, and for the work that you all do. Um, I was an advocate long before I was a lawyer. I did direct services for rape victims here in the state of Kansas. And I think that is probably the best education that I have on these issues is working directly with survivors and other direct service providers. And that really laid the foundation for my work. Although I did go to law school, I still feel like my, my entry level of education was to be an advocate. So thank you for all that you do um, to, to make your community safer. I'd like to let you know also that I am more than happy to share these slides. Um, I will probably just email them over to Ty Simpson. And if you would like a copy, I'm more than comfortable with you uh, sharing these slides. So um, I'm going to take you on a journey today, and the journey is the journey of Native women, but it's also sort of my journey as well as um, going from an activist to an attorney and back to an activist. And so some of the material that I'm going to be sharing with you is difficult material, but I try to always balance that difficult material with inspirational material. And so I would just ask that you stay on this roller coaster with me and um, hopefully you'll learn some new things and I will be uh, thrilled to take questions at the end. So please do um, save those questions and or type them into the chat or the question and answer um, section and I will have a time to engage with all of you. So thank you. We have to begin, well, we have to begin in some ways with what we know. Um, and um, uh, it's always a little fraught to share statistics because statistics, while they definitely help us understand the scope of the problem that we're facing, we also have to acknowledge that numbers can be very dehumanizing. And that is why I will continue through my presentation raising the voices of very real Native women who really are no, they're not statistics. 
we're human beings. And so um, while we do have to know as much as we can about this problem, I do want to make sure that I center the humanity in the crisis that we face. So I'll begin with this data. And this is the most recent official data from the United States Department of Justice. This is a free report that you can download. Um, it was released in May of 2016. And the name of the report is Violence Against American Indian and Alaska Native Women and Men. So I'm going to share with you just a little bit about what we know from this report. So this is a table that comes directly from the report. I screenshotted it, as you can see. Um, and this is the difficult information. So if we look over here with any time lifetime violence, um, we see here um, that according to this victimization study, over 84% of Native women will experience some form of violence in their lifetime. And then the second bar here, I wanna show you, this is the rate of sexual violence. So again, we see a significant rate of sexual violence in the lives of Native women. And so we, we do know that this kind of violence has a long lasting effect on the lives of people who've experienced it. But we also know that included in these numbers are people who have survived and people who are thriving. So we always have to remember that. Now I wanna talk about who is committing these crimes. This is difficult data because it's national in scope and it may not reflect the reality of a particular region or a particular tribe. But as we think about the national state of affairs, it's really important to talk about who is committing these crimes. This is another chart from the report. And this chart allows us to find out who are the perpetrators in these cases. And the answer is there are both native perpetrators and non-native perpetrators. But the unique aspect of this data is that most of the time in the United States, violent crime is what we call intra-racial. And what I mean by that is that most of the time in the United States, race is, or, or I'm sorry, violent crime happens within a racial category. So what I mean by that is that, um, uh, if you are a white victim in the United States, your perpetrator is more likely than not to be also white, okay? And that is really consistent across all races. There is one exception to that rule, and that is Native people. So most of the people who responded to this study reported that they had had at least one perpetrator who was non-native, okay? So that's re reflected here in this top chart. Over 97% of native women reported that they have had at least one perpetrator who was not native. So extremely high rate of interracial crime and very high rate for men as well. Now this is not to say that native people do not commit crimes like this. Um, absolutely that happens as well. And that's represented here in the bottom two bars where it talks about um, perpetrators who are also native. So we struggle with this data and I will get back to this data later on in my presentation. Now, one of the things that is not covered in the 2016 report is the violence against our two-spirit or LGBTQ plus native relatives. So we don't have national data on that question of the rate of violence perpetrated against our two-spirit relatives. We have some smaller studies that look at these issues. And 
right now what we know is that there are very high rates of violence being perpetrated against two-spirit people including very high rates of childhood sexual abuse as well as sexual and physical assault and then this data point down at the very bottom in one study in 2017 over 84 percent of two-spirit people reported experiencing bias-related victimization, also known as hate crimes. So we know that we are struggling with extremely high rates of violence, and I have set forth in my career to try to understand why. So in order to understand why, we have to go back to the roots. We have to go back to where this crisis began. Because if we don't know where this crisis began, it becomes very, very difficult to figure out solutions. And one of the things that, again, is, is challenging about sharing this information is that every single tribal nation, and there are, are over 570 federally recognized tribes in the United States, and each is unique. And so it's not advisable to sort of generalize, but for the purposes of time, that's what I'm going to do. So please keep in mind that not all tribes are the same, not all the histories are the same, and we need to be mindful of that as we understand this problem. But based on the research that I've done, been going on 25 years now studying this issue, there are some common themes that we find in the time before contact, right? So tribal nations always had legal systems. Tribal nations always had challenges. And so one of the things that um, I like to do is think about how we used to do things. And what I've discovered is that most of the time, traditionally in our cultures, we had systems that were very victim centric. So that means that the victim rather than the defendant is really the question in a legal proceeding. How do we support a victim to come forward and receive the justice they deserve? And that's a principle that I think still carries through for many of our tribal nations. We always had laws that prohibited domestic violence and sexual assault. But many times we also had systems that respected and held up women in our communities as being strong and central parts of our society. So patriarchy in the way we think of patriarchy that came from Europe is not consistent with many of the life ways of native people. So I start there so we can begin to understand how it is that violence became so common in our culture. When I was just a law student 25 years ago, I had the opportunity to take Indian law. Now I'm someone who did not grow up on a reservation. I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, which is I guess urban for Kansas. And um, in, that, um, in, that, in that world, I was not someone that encountered challenges with jurisdiction. I didn't know much about it. And so when I got to law school and had the opportunity to take Indian law for the first time, I was flabbergasted by the challenge um, that we face. And I decided to write my law school paper on my own people, the Muscogee people um, who are now in Oklahoma. And I wanted to understand how my people, the Creek people or Muscogee people had responded to gender-based violence. So I began my research and I discovered the journals and letters of William Bartram. Now, William Bartram was kind of an eccentric character. You see his picture here on the slide. Are we doing okay with tech? Yes, everything seems to be working as it okay. should. All right, sorry. I just saw someone pop in. I thought I might need a, an adjustment. So I apologize. 
Um, so what I discovered was that William Bartram was a white man, Quaker, who lived among my people, the Muscogee people, as well as the Cherokee people in what is now the southeastern part of the United States, primarily Georgia and Alabama. And he lived among us. He was an artist and a botanist. And so he spent a great deal of time uh, cataloging and drawing different plant and animal life in this part of the continent. And he wrote a lot. He wrote lots of journals and lots of letters. And one of the things that he had discovered was that he saw very little evidence of any kind of gender-based violence. In fact, in this passage, he talks about the fact that he not only did not see uh, uh, domestic violence, but he also didn't see people speaking disrespectfully about and to women. And this is something he remarks on several different times in his writings, right? So this got me very excited and, and, and a sense of inspiration about my own heritage and my own people. And so this got me excited about exploring more about this issue. So I continued my research and I learned that the Creek people, the Muscogee people, were one of the earliest nations to write down laws in English, right? Most of the time, our laws were transmitted orally. And in fact, my, my people did not have a written language until the 1840s. So when our people passed laws, they had to be written down in English. And I discovered that, again, the Creek Nation was one of the earliest to do this. And I read these laws that were written down in 1824 and came across this sexual assault law that was scribed by men in the Creek Nation. Now, one of the things that's fascinating about assimilation is that there are still sometimes clues and glimpses as to what our lives might have been like before. And in assimilation, there was a great deal of pressure put on the Creek people to become Christian, to uh, adopt uh, white um, uh, culture, and to become Christians. And so there was a great deal of effort to sort of assimilate. But somehow this law still managed to make, you know, make the page. And so you can see here why I'm so compelled by this, because what she say, it be law, is not consistent with the way in which white governments dealt with this crime, right? It was considered in many ways early on, again, laws coming over from England, that women were property of men under the law, right? And so this this law gives us a clue that that's not how our government operated. Women were not property of men. And so what this law tells me is that there was still a system in place that centered a victim of sexual violence in the aftermath, gave her agency, gave her a voice. And that's something that the American system, again, you know, passed down by English law, has really struggled with, right? And I know that most of you who are advocates know what I mean by that, right? The system is not always set up to protect the victim. So these are the kinds of stories that I encourage all of you to seek out when you are doing research. What do we know about the way in which we used to do things? And how can that inspire us to reform tribal law, right? So that's my story of my people. And it got me inspired to follow this journey for the rest of my career. So the next question is the question that journalists call me about every single day, it seems. And that is why. Why is it that Native people who once had systems that were protective of victims to a system today where the vast majority of Native women 
will be victims of violence? And that's the question that I seek to answer. I think it's important, first of all, to talk about this term sovereignty. The name of this lecture is Sovereignty of the Soul, and I want to tell you how I came up with that title. Sovereignty is a very basic concept in many regards, but it becomes very complicated when we start talking about um, tribal sovereignty. Sovereignty is just a reference to the power of a government to govern itself, the ability to make laws and be governed by those laws. We take it for granted in other contexts. So for example, today I sit and come to you from the state of Kansas, which is a sovereign state. And all that means is that the state of Kansas has the ability to make laws and be governed by those laws, right? So fairly straightforward, but we usually don't really think about it. It's sort of taken for granted. But in the case of tribal nations, as we'll see, the question of sovereignty becomes more complicated. So hold on to that thought as we go through the rest of the presentation today. When I started thinking about the question of sovereignty and the question of violence, one of the things that occurred to me is an idea that we all should be sovereign in and of ourselves. And by that, I mean that we should, as human beings, be able to make decisions about what happens to us, our bodies, and our lives. And what happens in the aftermath of crime like sexual violence is that there's a sense among many survivors that our own sovereignty, if you will, has been violated, that it's been disrespected, that somebody else decided to make decisions about our bodies and our lives. And that's a violation of our own internal sovereignty. So as I talk about the story of tribal nations dealing with violence against people in the community, I think there's a parallel between the challenges that tribal nations have, have experienced and the challenges that all survivors of violence experience. And I want you to keep that in mind as I talk about the history. So here's some of my answer to the question of why. Tribal nations, especially those with documentation, right, we know, had systems that responded effectively and honored victims. But our power to address violence has been weakened. We don't have the same powers that a state government has. And I believe that the sovereignty of tribal nations is directly connected to sovereignty of our individual lives. I wanna acknowledge that sexual violence is very much embedded in the history of the colonization of the United States. Now, Columbus um, is an interesting character. And I know that there are efforts across the country to rename Columbus Day, or I guess reframe Columbus Day. Columbus was a violent fellow. And so to the extent that we want to acknowledge that and we want to celebrate indigenous survival, Columbus Day has become a less popular holiday, I guess. And I wanna talk about Columbus because he is sort of a symbol of colonial violence. But more than being a symbol, I think we need to acknowledge that there was violence that was associated even early on with the folks that came to the shores of North America. This quote comes from the journal of a man who accompanied Christopher Columbus on his second journey in 1495. And this comes directly from his writings. And we see that even before he left the boat, he had targeted a native woman for violence. Right? And there's no sense here of shame. It's an arrogant passage where he decides for himself that he has a right to the body of this native woman. He ties her up. You, 
he beats her and then sexually assaults her. So when we talk about Columbus as a symbol, we also have to talk about the literal history as well. So sexual assault was a tool that many Europeans who came to this continent used to subdue the native population. So we have to acknowledge that history if we're gonna be honest about the origins of our crisis. The next part of my journey talks about federal policy towards native people. So I have sort of two prongs to my uh, discussion. One is the policies that were undertaken by the federal government. And the other is the actual laws and cases that address this crisis. So I'm starting out with the policy of removal. Most people have heard of the Trail of Tears. It's associated very closely with the Cherokee experience. So many people have heard of the Cherokee Trail of Tears, and that was a time period in which the federal government decided that in order to deal with the encroaching settlement, particularly again in Alabama and Georgia, that native people need to be moved away from that land. It was a valuable, valuable land for farmers and agriculturalists. So native people were moved against their will to Indian Territory, which is now the state of Oklahoma. And these journeys were very, very difficult journeys. Um, oftentimes we lost uh, elders and small children and babies on this forced march. This all happened in the 1830s. And it wasn't just the Cherokee Nation. It was many different nations, including my own, the Muscogee Creek people we call our experience the road of suffering, but it was very similar to the Cherokee experience. Now, what does this have to do with sexual assault? Well, one of the tragedies of this time period, in addition to losing thousands of our loved ones, was the experience of sexual violence. So what we know now from missionary records, from journalists, from journals that were written in this time period, is that when the tribal people stopped for the night to camp, and keep in mind, most of us are on foot, that there was rape happening in those evenings. So we have uh, documentation that soldiers would remove uh, a woman or a girl from the camp, sexually assault her, return her to the camp to proceed on the journey westward. And this happens systemically. And I, I think a lot of us can really relate to this when we think about, for example, any form of war zone or refugee zone. We often hear about this in the context of foreign governments, right? Where there are people fleeing or people migrating often against their will. And that sexual assault, according to many human rights organizations is something that we often see in those settings. So this is really no different. This is just from a couple hundred years ago, but it's the same dynamic where people are vulnerable. Who do you report the crime to if you're assaulted? There, there's no government and there's no accountability. And no, no one was prosecuted for the crimes during this time period. But removal didn't just take place in the Southeast. There are stories of removal across the continent. This is a picture from the Southwest in the 1860s. It's a picture of Navajo women, um, or Diné women is probably the, the better term. Um, and these women had also been removed forcibly from their homeland and were being held captive in a military uh, fort. Now, we don't know much about these women or children. We know that the picture was taken in the 1860s, but we know very little else about these women and what happened to them. But as a survivor and also as a former advocate, I tend to see trauma in this picture. Certainly there's fatigue, perhaps hunger, um, sadness, but also trauma. And I have to wonder, 
whether or not these women had also experienced sexual violence. We'll never know, but it is worth asking and it's worth our discussion. I also wanna talk about land loss in general. We know that native people were often swindled out of land. Um, land was outright stolen, removed from our homelands. Land loss is so much part of this story, but we often don't link it to trauma. We don't link it to sexual violence. So the reason I wanna raise this as an issue is because many tribal traditions, cultures and ceremonial ways require a connection to some aspect of the land. It might be a river or a mountain or some other landmark where our ancestors have prayed since time immemorial. And that trauma, when someone experiences trauma, there's a need among many survivors to find the spiritual or ceremonial uh, comfort in surviving. But what's happened to so many of us is that we've been removed from those spaces. We no longer have access to those spaces. And Judeo-Christianity is different because a church becomes holy. It can be built and become holy. But in many tribal traditions, our ways are connected to the land. And so the, the, the stripping of access to our sacred sites has had a profound impact on survival and solace and healing. So we have to remember that story along with the harms that just come from losing land. We also have to be honest when we talk about native children and a brainwashing policy instituted by the federal government. Starting in the, in the 1880s and continuing until the 1960s, the federal government supported an era which we now, known, now know as the boarding school era. It lasted many decades. It started when Congress was struggling with how to deal with what they characterized as the Indian problem. And in the 1880s, there were overt policies of extermination and war. But that is an expensive way, again, being somewhat tongue in cheek to deal with the Indian problem. In fact, members of Congress debated on the floor that killing Indians was an expensive activity. They actually did a cost benefit analysis. And the solution to that question was to brainwash native children. Again, this is not a covert activity. It is the overt policy in this time period. So the concept was if we remove children from native communities, take them far away from their homes and their families, we can brainwash them. We can basically teach them how to not be native anymore. And the motto of the very first boarding school set up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania was kill the Indian and save the man. And the idea was again, to tell children that the Indian identity that they were born with was a bad identity and that they needed to change it. And so these children were taken far away from their homelands and not allowed to practice traditional spiritual ways, certainly not allowed to uh, speak their language. And in fact, put in uniforms and treated as a sort of military academy. This is the exact same group of children just a few months later. So I'll show you that again. These are, are Apache children that were rounded up to be taken to boarding schools. And you can see here who took the picture because many times the military was involved in the capture of children to take to boarding schools. 
So the exact same group of children just a few months later. So we know a lot now about what's going on in this picture because survivors of boarding school are still alive today. Remember, this extended into the 1960s. So these children were not given a choice. Their parents were not given a choice. This was expected. Now, we know that these children suffered from loss of identity and the pressure to abandon all of their ways that they were raised with. But now we know more that sexual violence was oftentimes a part of their experience. We know now, for example, that, um, that there were certain Catholic leaders, Catholic priests who committed crimes against children. There's been many lawsuits about it. And, and a very similar dynamic here, that many of these children were punished physically and sexually. And when we think about the extent of this time period, many, many hundreds and thousands of Native children experienced this time period. And so if we want to be honest about how rape became so common among our people, we have to be honest about this time period as well. Now, many survivors of boarding schools have reported that they suffered tremendous PTSD from being in these schools and that they didn't learn to parent. They were raised by an institution and a harsh one at that, where they were punished pretty regularly for being Indian. So when we talk about the history and the legacy of sexual violence, we have to be honest about this time period. Now, I wanna take a pause here to do some honoring because one of the things that um, becomes apparent during this time period of the late 19th century into the 20th century is that there were people who spoke out. There were native people who spoke out. There were native people that went to Congress and testified that they had experienced uh, widespread violence in their communities brought in oftentimes by the military. Sarah Winnemucca is one of those many native people who spoke out in this time period. Sarah Winnemucca was a Paiute woman. She was very well educated. She spoke about five languages that we know of. And she was somebody who came to the East Coast to seek help from people who would have sympathy for the plight of her people. She actually had one-on-one -on -one opportunities to talk to the President of the United States when she was traveling the East Coast. And she would often talk about gender-based violence in her efforts to raise awareness. She was a well-known lecturer. She oftentimes would attract different sympathetic white folks to come and hear her speak. So she would often bill herself as a princess, an Indian princess, not because there was monarchy in her people's world, but because that made people want to come and hear her speak. The other thing about Miss Winnemucca is that she was the first native woman in the United States to write a book and get it published. And today that book is still available. It is in public domain, which is code for free. You can find it online. And it's called Life Among the Paiutes. So in this book, she goes through a lot of the trauma that her people have experienced. But what's so brave about the book is that she also talks about sexual violence. And if you think about this time period in the United States, you know that Sarah Winnemucca and other women uh, were struggling to articulate these challenges. And it really wasn't even safe for white women to come forward and talk about these kinds of crimes. And so here we have a native woman who is articulating this sexual violence as part of the trauma that her people were experiencing. So it wasn't a passive, we were not passive recipients of this behavior. We did a lot of work to try to address these crimes in the best ways that we knew how. 
So Sarah Winnemucca's book is an important text in the history of the rape crisis movement in the United States. Now, when I was trained to be an advocate uh, by a mainstream organization in the 1990s, I did my 40 hours of advocacy training that probably a lot of you provide that training now. But one of the things I learned in that training was that the rape crisis movement in the United States started in the 1960s or 1970s when we had uh, white women come forward and, and start to raise a consciousness about sexual violence. But I really want to challenge us in this movement to end violence, to acknowledge the Black women, the Native women, the Latinx women who did come forward and speak about these crimes. Their stories should be included in the history of our movement to end violence. Now I want to shift gears and I want to talk about sovereignty again. And I want to talk about laws that have made it more difficult for tribal nations to respond to crimes like domestic violence, sexual assault, and dating violence. So I'm gonna share two statutes with you. One is called the Major Crimes Act. The other is the Indian Civil Rights Act. And then I'll follow that by a discussion of a Supreme Court case called Oliphant versus Suquamish. So let's begin with the Major Crimes Act. Now the Major Crimes Act is still good law today still on the books, still enforced every day, usually by our friends in the United States attorney's offices. That's the law that they use. But I wanna tell you where the law came from so that we can understand how it may have changed the scope of tribal sovereignty. And the story begins with a murder. On this slide, you see crow dog on the left and spotted tail on the right. And these are two Brul Lakota men who were leaders in their community in the 1880s in the Dakota territory. And these two men had a feud. There were a lot of, there's a lot of history and debate about exactly what their feud was about. But we know that Crow Dog on the left shot and killed Spotted Tail. And in the aftermath of that homicide, Crow Dog was brought before the people to be adjudicated for the crime that he committed. And under the law, as it was for these people, for the Lakota people, the, the solution or the resolution of this particular homicide was that Crow Dog was to be ordered, was ordered to take care of Spotted Tail's extended family. So he became someone who was burdened with the obligation to make sure that Spotted Tail's family was provided with all of the material goods that they would need to survive. And that was the solution to that homicide. But Crow Dog was not a very friendly Indian from the white perspective. Crow Dog and Spotted Tail probably argued somewhat about the best way to deal with the encroaching settlement and the white settlers. And Crow Dog was considered to be less friendly than Spotted Tail. So the white community in this area as well as the federal officials who are named Indian agents were really outraged by what they, see, what they saw as a slap on the wrist. They felt that Crow Dog was a renegade and that he should be executed for his crime against Spotted Tail. And so that's exactly what they did. The federal officials filed criminal charges against Crow Dog and he was ultimately sentenced to death. But Crow Dog had a very good legal argument that he took all the way to the US Supreme Court in 1883. He and his lawyers argued that the federal government had no authority in this case because 
they were essentially a foreign government. It'd be sort of like if France came to Kansas and decided to arrest and prosecute. It doesn't make any sense. And the Lakota people had treaties that bounded the reservation and said, this is the Indian land. So Crow Dog argued that he should not be held accountable in white courts because the white courts should have no authority on the Indian reservation. Now, surprisingly, a lot of people are shocked by this. He won that case. The Supreme Court sided with him and said, yes, we may not like the outcome here. Yes, we may think that the Indian people have a less civilized system, but he's right. There's nothing that allows a foreign government, the federal government, to have authority over this crime. And so Crow Dog was not executed and in fact returned to this community. But that led to more outrage again from federal officials and from the white community who said, this is not acceptable. We need to be able to prosecute men like Crow Dog in federal court. And just two years after the Supreme Court case, Congress passed the Major Crimes Act. Again, this is the law that is relied on today on most Indian reservations in the lower 48. And what this law did was a, Congress simply just said in a law that we from here on out will have authority over serious crimes on Indian reservations. So they basically said, there's no law that allows us to do it according to the Supreme Court. So let's pass that law. And it was a unilateral approach. Tribal nations certainly did not ask for this law. Um, wasn't The tribal nations were not consulted about this law, but it essentially allows the federal government authority on Indian reservations. And this is still the law that's used today to prosecute serious crimes in the federal government. Okay. So what's important to remember about this law and the origin of it is that it is used today to protect our Indian communities. So a homicide, a child sexual abuse case, a trafficking case can end up in federal court. But keep in mind that the origin of the law was to punish a bad Indian, Crow Dog. That was, that was the reason this law was passed. It wasn't passed in a sense of we need to do more for victims. It was passed in a sense of we need to punish the bad. So today this law still exists. And in many nations across the country, tribal nations have very positive relationships with federal partners, including assistant US attorneys, the FBI, and the like. But it hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been smooth. And so tribal nations have struggled in some cases to get cases to be taken seriously. We're on our way, but there's still challenges. And the other thing that happens when you pass a federal law like this is do tribes still have the authority? Did the Major Crimes Act strip the tribes of the sovereign right to prosecute serious crimes? No, it did not. I think that's what Congress meant to do. I think in 1885, Congress said, we're gonna replace whatever the system is that tribal nations have. And we're going to simply add in its place federal jurisdiction. But in fact, Congress didn't quite do that. And so today, even though you do have federal authority over these serious crimes committed by Indians, tribes also retain this authority in a technical sense. There are tribal nations that prosecute rape and prosecute homicide and they are partners or concurrent with our federal government. So it's what we call concurrent jurisdiction, jurisdiction at the same time. The federal government may have authority over a crime 
and the tribal government may have authority over that same crime. So it's important to remember that tribal nations still retain the authority in a technical sense to prosecute these crimes. Next, I want to move to the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968. Now the Indian Civil Rights Act is a very interesting law. It sounds like a great law. Everybody wants civil rights. And in the 1960s, Congress passed numerous laws aimed at addressing the civil liberties of people of color. But the Indian Civil Rights Act is a little different. The Indian Civil Rights Act is sort of another unilateral piece of legislation passed by Congress without really any tribal input. And it does a number of things. It, it requires tribal nations to uh, comply with the US constitutional language from the Bill of Rights, um, puts some burden on tribal courts uh, that didn't exist before. But from the violent crime perspective, I want to focus on the sentencing cap that originated with the Indian Civil Rights Act. So initially, when it was passed in 1968, what the Indian Civil Rights Act says is that at the time, the maximum penalty that a tribe could impose for any crime would be a six month jail sentence and or a $500 fine. And that would apply no matter which crime the tribe was prosecuting. So imagine if you will, a tribal nation seeking to respond to a serious crime like homicide, kidnapping, rape, child sexual abuse, that the maximum penalty that can be imposed by a tribal judge is six months. Doesn't seem like enough time for a serious crime like that. Now later in the 1980s, Congress increased that power to one year or a $5,000 fine. So pretty limiting, especially when you think about felonies. Right? So imagine a survivor who's trying to make the very difficult decision about whether to come forward and tell what happened. And knowing that even if everything goes right, and even if the tribe is able to convict, the maximum penalty is one year. For many survivors, this does not feel safe. This does not feel like a system that's going to protect the community from someone who has done something horrible. So from my perspective, I believe that the Indian Civil Rights Act limitation on punishment should be changed. It should be altered to allow tribes to have a sentence that matches the crime. I'll say more about this in a few minutes. The final aspect of federal Indian law that I want to share with you today is a Supreme Court case from 1978 called Oliphant versus Suquamish. The Suquamish tribe is a smaller tribe in Washington state. And in the 1970s, they had an incident involving two white men who lived and worked on the reservation. Mr. Oliphant was one of the defendants and uh, his, um, he had, there were two men actually in this case, but Oliphant is the one that we know the case by. Mr. Oliphant and his co-defendant were arrested by the Suquamish tribal police for a series of crimes committed when they were really being drunk and disorderly. Um, one of the defendants actually punched a tribal police officer in the face. And the other defendant led police on a short but very high speed chase that thankfully ended in property damage and no injuries. So the Suquamish Nation, because the crimes were committed on their reservation, filed criminal charges and proceeded to prosecute these two men. Oliphant's argument 
was I should not be held accountable in tribal court. I'm not Suquamish. I don't vote for Suquamish leaders and I don't sit on Suquamish juries. Therefore, it's unfair for me to be held accountable by the tribal court. Now imagine making again this argument in any other context. So for example, I'm in Kansas, let's say I travel to Idaho and I commit a robbery in a liquor store, something like that. And then I brought before the judge and I say to the judge in Idaho, I don't vote in Idaho and I don't sit on Idaho juries. Therefore, you should not be able to prosecute me. It really sounds ludicrous in any other context. But the Supreme Court sided with Oliphant and said the tribal nation had lost authority over non-Indians, right? And so this is still good law. And when the Supreme Court decides a case involving one Indian tribe, it almost always applies to all Indian tribes. So today, it doesn't matter what the non-native person does on a reservation, the tribal government will not have authority to prosecute that crime. They must depend on the federal officials or in some cases with certain tribes, it could be state officials to prosecute these types of crimes. Now recall the statistics that I showed you at the very beginning of this lecture that show that most native people in the United States report that they have had at least one non-native perpetrator. Is that the fault of Oliphant? Is that because non-Indian offenders cannot be held accountable in tribal court? You know, we'll really never know for sure, and here's why. We don't have crime data from 1977. So we don't know how many non-Indians were perpetrating crimes against Indians before 1978. We don't have that data, it doesn't exist. So it's not accurate to say that Oliphant is the reason for those discrepancies in the criminal justice data. But what we do know is that many tribal police officers have talked about the fact that non-Indians, especially predatory criminals, career criminals, know about this case. And they may be attracted to Indian country as a location where they could get away with a crime. Now, keep in mind, again, it's not a literal vacuum because the US attorney's offices or state prosecutors do have authority to prosecute non-natives. But I do think we have to be thoughtful about why the statistics are the way they are and why we need to restore authority to tribal nations so that they can take appropriate action when someone is victimized. So by the end of the 20th century, tribal nations are struggling to respond to crime. First, due to Oliphant, we're only able to prosecute other native people, that we have a significant limitation on the sentencing authority, and that tribes are poor. Most tribal nations struggle with providing basic governmental services due to poverty. There are certainly exceptions to that. There are a handful of tribes that are wealthy, but by and large, tribes struggle. A criminal justice system, by the way, is a very expensive government activity. It requires the expenditure of a lot of money to run a comprehensive criminal justice system. So tribes are often completely dependent on federal grant programs to sustain their, their criminal justice system. Now I'll just put a bookmark here. Maybe this is something we can discuss in the Q&A. But tribal nations still have some unique status in that they may be able to create systems of accountability that differ from the Western law and order system. 
So for example, rather than sentencing to jail, a tribal nation could create a therapeutic intervention system that doesn't lock people up and never bring them back, but is designed to rehabilitate and to bring healing to the community. So Western law and order is something we talk a lot about right now in our culture. And some people will critique it as being overly harsh, overly targeted to people of color. But tribal nations, although our sentencing limitation exists, the Indian Civil Rights Act does not limit other kinds of sanctions like community service or public apologies or other kinds of sort of ways of resolving disputes in the community. So keep your eye on that. Now I'm getting to the part of the presentation that I love the best because I wanna share with you what Native women have been able to do to address all of the problems that I've been describing. So I'll begin with the Tribal Law and Order Act, which was signed by President Obama in July, just 10 years ago. Now, this was a, a, a law that many, many Native people, advocates, tribal leaders, survivors, came together to articulate some of the challenges that tribal nations have been experiencing with crime. This law does a lot of different things. It requires federal prosecutors to release data on an annual basis about the crimes that they prosecute and the crimes that they don't. But I wanna focus on one aspect of the law and that is the Indian Civil Rights Act limitation to one year incarceration. The Tribal Law and Order Act changes that. The Tribal Law and Order Act now allows tribes the option of sentencing a perpetrator to up to nine years. Okay. Three years per offense stacked to nine. So now tribal nations do have another tool in their toolbox, a little bit lengthier sentence, still limited, but more than a year. And I have to tell you, it was a fight. It was not an easy fight. We had to keep going back to educate lawmakers about the crisis that we experience, the crises that we experience. But it was signed into law. And today tribal nations have that option with a stronger sentencing power that's affiliated with it. So one victory down, still a long way to go, right? So we kept working. Again, myself, other advocates, coalitions, lots of people working on this issue. And we were able to get the Violence Against Women Act reauthorized in 2013. Now, the very exciting section of the Violence Against Women Act of 2013 was a start of chipping away at the rule established in Oliphant. What this law does is it allows tribal nations the option, not the requirement because it's an option, to prosecute non-Indians for the first time since 1978. It is a limited expansion of jurisdiction. It only applies to domestic violence and, violent, and, and, and violations of a protection order. What we were able to articulate to lawmakers was that many, many Native people living on reservations today are married to non-Indians and our domestic violence rate is through the roof. And what we want Congress as Native women and tribal leaders is we want the power to do something about that. We want the power to hold folks accountable who are living on reservations, married into our communities and causing trauma. So we were able to get that small sliver of jurisdiction that was taken away by Oliphant. 
And today there are tribes that are prosecuting non-Indians for domestic violence. But we didn't address other crimes. Again, it's like a fight for every little crumb. We still lack jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit homicides, rape, child sexual abuse, any other crime other than domestic violence. So right now we are working to change that. And there is a version of the Violence Against Women Act currently sitting in the Senate that would expand this power to include sexual assault, child sex abuse, sex trafficking, um, and would allow tribes to prosecute non-Indians who commit those kinds of acts. So we're waiting and hoping that Congress will pass that law and that the president will sign it. The other crime, by the way, that would be covered by the new version is assault on a tribal police officer because we've had issues with that in some of our communities. So we wanna protect victims, we wanna protect police. All we want is the, the ability to protect our own communities. And that's what we're working for. I wanna talk as I close today about a very important Supreme Court case that many, many Native advocates came together to work on. It's a very fascinating story to me, so I wanna share it with you. I think most of us know a Dollar General store. There's lots of dollar stores, right? There's Dollar General, Family Dollar, there's 99 cent stores, there's all kinds of retail establishments uh, that are sort of that $1 uh, hook to the customer. Dollar General has a lot of retail establishments sprinkled throughout the United States. Sometimes it may be the only retail store on a reservation. Now this Dollar General store at issue in this case uh, was on the Mississippi Choctaw Reservation. So Dollar General sought to establish a store on this reservation and signed documents um, and got a business license from the tribe, everything you would really need to do to set up um, a system or a store rather on a reservation. It's a very sad story from there because one summer there was a young Choctaw boy, the age of 13, and he was working in the store as part of a program to teach kids job skills. So the, the tribe and the businesses on the reservation created a job opportunity program. It was really to provide young teens with a look behind the scenes at a business to learn about what it looks like behind the scenes to work in a store like this. And so this young Choctaw boy was placed in this store to learn and to, to get some skills. But unfortunately, the white manager of this store assaulted him, molested him. And this young child bravely came forward and told his parents about what happened. Now this manager was fired. He was banished from the reservation, but of course the tribe could not prosecute him. They could not charge him with a crime because he's non-Indian. So instead, what this family did is decided to file a civil lawsuit in tribal court against the Dollar General Corporation. And their argument was that Dollar General hired this person. He may have had other crimes that he'd been committing. And so Dollar General should have to pay for that. Dollar General should have to provide compensation to this family for the harm that happened to their child. Now this isn't an easy case to win because in order to win in tribal court or any court, this family would have to prove that Dollar General knew that this person was a danger. And that's a hard thing to win, but the family wanted to go for it anyway. Dollar General's response, we should not be in tribal court. We're like Oliphant. Even though this is a civil case, 
we are a non-Indian business and it wouldn't be fair for the tribe to hold us accountable. So they wouldn't even get to the merits of the lawsuit. They appealed it all the way to the US Supreme Court saying along the way through every court appeal that we don't belong in tribal court. It wouldn't be fair. And the Choctaw tribe continued to respond to that. Went all the way to the US Supreme Court. It's what we call a tort or a personal injury action. Again, no criminal accountability here, civil accountability. One of the things that I started thinking about along with many other native activists and attorneys was we should file a brief about victims in this case because sort of the victim fell off the page a little bit as the case became appealed to different courts. It was the Choctaw tribe against Dollar General. That was the fight. And so the victim no longer was really part of this story. And we decided that the court should have a chance to hear the voices of native people who had been victimized by non-Indians. So we decided to file what's called an amicus brief. We're not actually party to the case, but we have something to say about it that we think will help the court make its decision. So we filed a brief on behalf of the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center and over a hundred other organizations that work on behalf of victims. So we had 107, 108 clients in this case. And it wasn't just native organizations that signed on. We had a number of non-native organizations that understood what was at stake and decided to side with our efforts. So within this brief, this is a picture of the cover and you have to format everything in a very specific way and have it printed in a very specific way. But this is the cover of that brief. And what we said in our brief is, we already lost criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians. We can't lose civil jurisdiction too because it will hurt victims and it will limit the options that victims have to find some form of justice in tribal court. So we filed the brief and then when the case was heard in front of the US Supreme Court, we showed up. I went inside to listen to the arguments and there were many, many native activists that had a vigil outside the US Supreme Court to raise awareness, to stake a claim, to say we're here. And you have to remember, and all of you know this, that most of the time, Native people don't report. So the vast majority of crimes against Native people are never reported and never prosecuted. There's a lot of good reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons that people do not report. But this was a day of justice for many victims because even though maybe their case wasn't prosecuted, they had the opportunity to speak out for justice for someone else, for this child who was now in his 20s, by the way. It takes a very long time for these cases to reach the court. So we sat outside, we raised awareness, and it was a very healing, wonderful day. It was one of those beautiful days in December. It was a little, you know, jacket weather, but it was a beautiful day. And it was such a privilege to be part of this moment. So I'm sure you're all wondering if we won the case. It was a tie vote. If you'll remember, we had a justice named Antonin Scalia and Mr. Scalia passed away in his sleep after this case was argued in February. So, the court is left with eight justices. And it was a tie vote. We were one vote away from losing this civil power. But because the tribe had won in the lower court, the case then could proceed. The lower court is the winner in a tie vote. So that case 
was a victory in some ways, although it didn't set national precedent because it was never decided by the Supreme Court. So this gave us some hope that our stories in these briefs would begin to make a difference. And so we started filing these kinds of briefs in other Supreme Court cases, just to make sure that the justices on the court kept in mind the trauma that victims experience when their cases don't go forward. And in all of the other cases where we have filed briefs, we have won. And we're gonna continue in this effort to raise awareness about Indian reservation crime in the Supreme Court. So that's my story of going from a law student all the way to the Supreme Court. And it has been an honor. I wanna share with you the voice of Joy Harjo, who is also Muskogee. She is the current and first native poet laureate in the United States. And when I have hard days that we all have in this work, I turn to her poetry because it is so healing. She has this wonderful poem called the fear poem. She talks about that fear cannot take over us. So I wanna share that with you. I did write a book called The Beginning and End of Rape, which goes into a lot more detail about all of the issues I've been discussing. And here is my contact information my email, my website, and my Twitter handle. Again, thank you for this tremendous honor and thank you for the work that you do. You are saving lives and you are not thanked enough. So, Mado. Uh, so like deep, deep thanks and gratitude for your time with us. Um, there were, there's so much in there that uh, is both affirming and valuable for a lot of us as educators and advocates and policymakers. I hope you all feel like you took something meaningful away and even added to your own, you know, scope of knowledge that you have. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thankfully, we have about 10 minutes left. So in those 10 minutes, I want to address a couple of great questions that came through in the chat. Um, in your opinion, Sarah, do you think that the Senate is dragging their feet with reauthorizing VAWA because they don't want us to have um, more jurisdictional and sovereignty power? And are they afraid of losing power? Yes. Um, so the Violence Against Women Act that has the provisions that I and many people are supporting to enhance or expand or return probably would be better the authority to take action in any case, no matter who commits it. So that version passed the House. So it has passed the House. And then we have sort of a battle in the Senate. There's a uh, Democrat version of VAWA and there's a Republican version of VAWA. Um, and it has become bipartisan, or it's become a partisan issue, unfortunately. Um, VAWA was originally passed in 1994 as a bipartisan bill. It was also called the Biden-Hatch law. And if you think about, you know, Joe Biden and Orrin Hatch, very different political opinions and approaches, they were on the same page with the original Violence Against Women Act. But unfortunately now, because I think we are asking for more we're, we're, we're kind of in a stalemate. So there's a democratic version of VAWA, which includes this expansion or return of tribal authority. And there's a Republican version of the, of the bill, a Senate version of the bill that doesn't do those things. And so that's where we're stuck right now. And I do think just from my experience, you know, being on the Hill and talking to lawmakers is that I think there's still a level of ignorance uh, um, that I see about tribal courts and tribal justice. And I think people are scared of what they don't know. I think that might be part of it. You know, If you've never been to a tribe or seen a tribal courtroom, you might have some stereotypes or something along those lines. And so we're just trying to continue to educate and trying to make sure that lawmakers know that tribal courts are 
courts and deserve the authority that any other court has. So that's where we are right now. Thank you for asking that. I think that's a phenomenal question. And actually the app application that we have in Idaho is the, uh, the legislation that was successfully passed in March that um, um, Bart Davis addressed and that we are in our building on was um, presented and, you know, sort of spearheaded by Republican uh, representatives in the Idaho legislature. So it was interesting to see the way that that came about. Um, and I think that there's a parallel here too that we can draw between sovereignty jurisdiction and also um, the level of economic influence tribes have in Idaho. I think that the five tribes in Idaho collectively inject about $39 million into the economy mm -hmm. and are some of the like singular highest employing organizations in their in their areas in the respective parts of the state. So um, that also is a form of sovereignty that we're not recognizing that we should be leaning on when it comes to influencing policy. So you're absolutely right in that in that place. So thank you for that question. Um, there was an additional question that actually is, is sort of near and dear to my heart about transformative justice. Mm. Um, how do we balance full transformative justice and the ways rape crisis work is embedded with police and punitive justice, mm -hmm. especially if a victim is unsure of whether to come forward? How does a, a, a tribe decide to make a therapeutic choice? Oh my gosh, this is a hard question. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm working on it. I've got a, I've got an article uh, out that I, I started um, uh, trying to think through this issue. Uh, if you go to my webpage, sarahdeer.com, I've, I've posted all of my articles and analysis for free. Um, you can just go to my website and download anything like that. Um, but uh, uh, I struggle with this, to be very honest. I think you just kind of have to tell how you're wired. But when I first went to law school, I wanted to be a, a sex crimes prosecutor. That, that's why I went to law school. And so there's still that. And even though I never ended up doing that, I ended up doing lots of other things. But still somewhere in my brain is sort of hardwired that the way we always should be dealing with violence is locking folks up and punishing. And it's challenging to think about other ways of responding to violence. Um, you know, I, I get nervous about being too soft on violent crime. That's just, again, the way my head works. And, you know, we've all seen those really, really violent offenders who you have to wonder, you know, is there a way to, for them to change, especially when folks have a lot of different victims. Yeah. So I struggle with this. Thank but you. I do think that there are victims who would much rather have the opportunity to say their piece, to be able to communicate to the entire community what has happened, mm -hmm. and to find a way to work through it without sort of resorting to the Western law and order model. So I think we have to think about those. And tribes are really lucky in that aspect because many of our tribal communities still have a, a sort of conception or a philosophy about harm that seeks to repair rather than to punish. And so I'm intrigued by that. I'm challenged by that. Um, it's hard to think of those systems, but we're not always as tribal nations bound to the way things are done in the non-native world. Mm. We are uniquely positioned to tap into those philosophies and tap into our creative problem-solving ability to have systems that will really work and make a difference for our community. So it's hard. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that. Leave it at that. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that that is actually a great way to wrap up your discussion with us. I know we didn't have time to get to all of the questions, although we have some great questions to think about and can even explore in some of the sessions, uh, the remaining sessions of the conference. Um, again, Sarah, thank you so much for having, for coming to join us. Um, SarahDeer.com, um, the book lists on Google, anything you do to continue to engage. We will um, collect resources in your slide deck and send those out to participants so they have a follow-up there as well. Uh, just a couple of things for tomorrow. We will see you all at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time for Lenny Hayes, who addresses violence against the Indigenous <laughs> 
and the unique needs um, for healing spaces and, and um, community conversations around violence, men who choose to use violence or men adversely impacted by um, sexual and domestic violence as well. So you all are absolutely in for a treat with Lenny who's not only funny and dynamic, but very uh, thought provoking. Um, and I am absolutely you know, excited for the rest of the month. Sarah, again, thanks for coming. For the rest of you, thanks for joining us. Hamak is Klatsiao. We will um, see you tomorrow morning. Um, I will also really quickly again, post in the chat, the um, live pr program with live links. If you didn't have it in your email, um, stay tuned, reach out if you have questions. But again, thank you all. It was good to have you. Yochkolo, that is all. Mm -hmm.